Good morning, everybody. Welcome. I hope we see you healthy and safe in your offices and home offices. First of all, I want to thank you in the audience for taking part in the poll during the coffee break. The thanks, the results of your votes will be shown during the session. My name is Joachim Hein, and I'm happy to present you today an interesting panel with high level participants from regulators, policymakers, and an asset manager. We will now scrutinize in this regulatory panel what have we learned from the COVID-19 market reaction. For this purpose, we will discuss issues like operational resilience of the fund sector during the sharp market downturn and rebound, vulnerabilities during the times of stress. We will discuss how to strengthen the resilience of investment management. And then we will open to the questions from the audience, from you, which please use the chat function. In the next 75 minutes, I'm presenting a panel to you, which may be small, but I think high profile. For the full details, please look at the biographies available online. I welcome here Jos Hövelmann, member of the executive board, Dutch Authority for the Financial Markets, AFM. Welcome. Patrick Simeon, CEO, Chief of Staff and Public Affairs, BNP Paribas Asset Management. Welcome, nice to have you here. Thank you. Robert Taylor from UK FCA and here in his role as the chair of IOSCO Committee 5 relating to investment management. Nice to have you here. Thank you very much. And Evert van Walsum, Head of Investors and Issues Department, European Securities and Markets Authority, ESMA. Nice that you are here. Thank you. I'm very happy to see you here all safe and healthy on this panel. Now, before we really dive deeper into the issue, let's have a short warm up round. Please find short answers. Is today the right time to start the lessons learned exercise of COVID-19 market stress and discuss long-term implications? Robert, what's your view on that? <coughs> well, to be perfectly honest at IOSCO, we are still actually looking at some of the issues there. We've just finished uh, looking at the money market um, situation and uh, we are looking at our final report right now on that, but we want to look at all funds in the liquidity and the liquidity they, they, um, issues they face. And um, we still have some work to do in that space. The time is right. Um, there's, a, there's a wealth of experience to share with, with, with regulators and, um, and, uh, and your businesses themselves, but, um, but there's a lot of work still to do. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Um, uh, Evert, from your perspective within ESMA, how did the market crisis hit ESMA as a European supervisor? Well, clearly it, is, uh, it has been a high priority uh, for, for ESMA. It, there's no, no doubt about, uh, about that. Uh, regarding the question whether it's, it's, it's now time, the right time to, to look into the lessons learned, uh, the answer is, is yes, because we, we have to. Uh, but also there's, there's now plenty of data available uh, to, to do a, a further, further analysis Thank you. based Thank on you. The, the various work streams that we had uh, in the past few months. Yeah, thank you. And Jos, uh, did you manage a more operational approach of an NCA during this phase of the crisis? Oh. Good morning, everybody. Yes, of course. Certainly, we had to step up our our monitoring and uh, and the frequency of contacts that we had with the industry. Actually, I think it's always good to to start thinking, even though we may not be out of the woods yet. And it seems to me that the COVID has uh, strengthened existing trends, like uh, low interest rates. We may even be uh, faced with them for a longer period, and also the uh, uh, yeah, digitalization of the world in general and the financial sector, especially as uh, yeah, progressed further. And actually, if I may, I think it's not only about thinking, but also you can take some actions already. Some things that we did is we, we, we sent a letter basically to our fund management industry to, to encourage them to look at their toolbox for, uh, for liquidity management. 
And second, we have become quite focal when it comes to warnings to the wider public about financial crime that has been uh, picking up lately. Thank okay. you. Okay. And Patrick, uh, did you as an internationally organized asset manager already work through an early lessons learned exercise? Uh, yes, definitely. I think uh, we and, and most asset managers have uh, adapted uh, quite a lot during this crisis and, and now uh, well, unfortunately, we're used to living with this uh, virus in, in a new normal. And I think it's the right moment to uh, look at the lessons because um, well, on the, the financial crisis, at least on the asset price side, is, uh, I would say, uh, mainly behind us. At least uh, the, the, we've recovered part of the drawdown. Uh, however, uh, I would say that we're still in a post-trauma mode because uh, the cost of liquidity is still uh, not uh, back to normal. Um, and uh, I would say that investors uh, are still uh, uh, post-crisis and there's still uh, a lot of changes uh, on the investor side. Yes, uh, thank you, Patrick. I think that will be in the next minute of special interest, investors' activities, what happened in the market segments, and especially the role of the central banks. Um, let's turn again to you, Patrick. How quick did you feel the reactions and redemption pressure from investors, and in which market segments? Uh, so, well, of course, there was a big difference between uh, institutional clients and, and retail clients. Uh, on the institutional clients, uh, we saw uh, quite strong uh, outflows um, uh, in March, uh, especially uh, in money market ponds and, and in asset classes uh, like high yields, which become uh, which be were illiquid, which became illiquid in March. Uh, but however, there wasn't a one-way flow in that uh, we also saw uh, inflows, uh, even in money market funds, uh, we saw... Um, uh, first outflow, but then quite quickly after uh, inflows. Uh, I think um, that institutional clients uh, first uh, in March were quite afraid and um, uh, took out the money to put it on uh, bank accounts. Uh, but, but then when the, the uh, uh, drawdown down happened and market had uh, and gone down quite a lot. Uh, there were also counter-cyclical uh, investors that came in and put on more risk. Uh, so that uh, balanced it quite quickly. And now, uh, as I said, I think that uh, we're in a kind of a post-crisis trauma and uh, investors uh, are, are now coming back uh, with a longer term view. And um, there's quite a lot of uh, new cash. If you look at uh, money market funds, uh, since the beginning of the year, there's uh, over 100 billion in new cash since the beginning of the year. Uh, so it means that uh, institutional clients and corporates uh, are uh, pulling on, on their, their credit lines and, and keeping the money in the uh, uh, money market funds. And on the other side, meaning uh, middle and long term funds, uh, there's also an increase in uh, long term investments, for example, in equity. So that's for the uh, institu institutional clients. Uh, on the retail side, it's a very different story. Uh, we've had, uh, unfortunately, redemptions uh, in March, I would say, unfortunately, because um, it shows that uh, institutional clients, no, retail clients, sorry, uh, sometimes still come out at the wrong moment and uh, still don't have a long, long term enough um, view. And there's still a lot of uh, uh, education to be done there uh, and uh, the other thing is that uh, retail clients have um, saved quite a lot in the, after after this crisis they were forced to save and couldn't consume uh, during the lockdown uh, and I think that that really uh, puts us uh, a lot of responsibility to us and to uh, regulators uh, to continue educating uh, retail clients but also to provide uh, new types of funds or so long-term funds uh, so that uh, retail investors uh, in the future uh, don't uh, redeem at the worst moment and, and stay invested on the long term. Patrick, yes. Um, uh, taking your word of a traumatic experience, um, uh, let's go to the NCAs. Joe, Joe yes, uh, what's your view as an NCA on the role of central banks? 
Yes, let me say that uh, we had no traumas in the Netherlands. Uh, to be honest, I think our fund uh, fund industry did uh, reasonably well. We saw a few few suspensions, but not uh, not on a big scale. The main reason for that is that the big players are pension funds in the Netherlands. They have a long uh, long term horizon. But speaking of pension funds, what is more important is they were faced with uh, cash margin calls due to the loss interest rate. Uh, by derivatives portfolios. So even though maybe they did not want to trade, they were forced to trade because they had to meet these margin calls. And thus they became one factor contributing to this dash for cash in the, in the global markets. And of course, we will never know what would have happened if, if central banks had not stepped in. But of course, there are, uh, are scenarios thinkable where we would have had some, some serious consequences. I think that uh, uh, we cannot always wait for central banks to come to the rescue of the of the works of the the, the world. Uh, markets should not be private in good times and public in bad times. So I think we should get our own house uh, in order and make sure that we can function without the support of central banks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. It's about the lender of last resort discussion. Yes, um, um, Evert, um, if you compare the role of the central banks maybe as a sort of circuit breakers during the crisis, with that of ESMA, who is more active and in what respect? Well, um, first of all, I think it's uh, fair to say that ESMA has a very different role from, from the central bank uh, in Chile. But going into the, the role of the central bank, I would like to echo Rob's comment on we never know what would have happened if, if there, there was no intervention of central banks. But to us, it's clear is that, uh, especially for the money market funds, central bank action has, has been instrumental to restore uh, confidence in, in the markets. So you've, you've seen large uh, outflows in, in use denominated LVNAPs, so minus 20% in two weeks time. In Euro denominated VNAPs, minus 50% of assets under management in two weeks time. At the same time, large inflows in public debt, CNAPs. And, and what you see is that central bank support and issuance of uh, corporate commercial paper at the end of March has been very important uh, to, to, uh, to increase uh, liquidity uh, there. And I think, it's fair to say that in mid-July we were, were slightly back to normal. So I think lessons learned from, from that intervention is clearly that there are vulnerabilities still, especially in the market fund sector. Uh, basically, um, if you look at secondary markets, so liquidity money market funds is, is quite low even in normal times. So in stress situations, this, this may be a, an aggravating factor and certainly also with the design of the LVNAPs after 2008 crisis, there's still questions whether the regulatory framework for LVNAPs really was an improvement given the stress situation. So I think in the upcoming review of the money market fund regulation, this could be something to, to, be, uh, to be discovered. And also I'm aware of the, the FSP, Yosco and ESMA are embarking on work to see whether this, uh, this uh, money market fund framework is, is still uh, up to speed because it, as as you you've mentioned you know central bank as 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 last resort measure should not be a uh, default in the money market fund sector well thank you Evert. let's widen the scope uh, to one who knows and observes the activities of different ncas over the world um, robert from your point of view from my osco um, did the ncas correctly connect the issue issue of market liquidity on the one side and that of fund liquidity itself on the other side? Well, I think I, I wanted to just mention uh, um, the very first meeting I had between um, the FSB members and um, IOSCO members. And, um, you know, I'd been sitting there watching at the FCA a lot of activity um, around specific funds. There was a lot of operational activity where we were um, dealing with funds that uh, looked like they were having some real liquidity issues and indeed did have some liquidity issues. But at the same time, um, the central banks did step in. But the thing that was interesting to me at that very first meeting was that um, our central bank colleagues took all the credit 
for saving everything and had no um, no understanding for the activities of what we do as securities market regulators on the sort of operational side of specific funds themselves. But that being said, I think there were some so there was some clumsiness that I uh, would observe uh, in terms of connecting what the market regulators were doing uh, alongside what the um, uh, what the central bankers were actually doing. Um, and that means that uh, that whole question of, again, going back to what everyone else has said, um, you know, is the, are the central banks really the lenders of last resort in this space, particularly within the money market fund space? That's a question that they're asking and that we're trying to actually demonstrate in terms of what, what they actually, what actually took place. Um, but I, I think the best way to say is, is that there were some good examples, but there are still, there's still some clumsiness out there uh, from what I've observed um, uh, with most of my colleagues. Thank you. Um, uh, and taking your idea of serving all the merits, I think it's, it's good to look at the operational resilience of the fund sector during that phase. Therefore, um, it's uh, mainly these questions regarding they go to the regulator's perspective now. So um, first, uh, Jos, um, looking at the Dutch fund sector, do you see a high level of um, operational resilience of asset managers across the board? as we've just heard, um, and uh, maybe how did the, did the asset managers perform managing the risks? I think, uh, to be fair, maybe it was even better than expected because almost overnight people had to move from the office to work at home and it went very smoothly. In my wildest dreams, I could not have, uh, have uh, expected this. So there, I think there was a positive uh, surprise. Of course, there may be issues like, let's say, the four eyes principle, uh, reporting, uh, okay. Uh, maybe what went not totally well was that we saw a huge influx of new retail clients, people who wanted to, to do some bottom fishing after market sets uh, come down. And firms had some difficulties to, to onboard all these uh, new clients. So that may be one, one element that went not as good as it should have been. For me, the, the more important thing is that now working from home, what does it mean more long term for, for morality, for, for integrity? Will there be more cutting of corners? So we have to, to wait and see what will happen there. Oh, thank you, Jos. And uh, widening the scope to uh... Abbott now, um, uh, uh, do you see any differences between the NCA's reaction in your remit, maybe regarding information gathering, collecting, and having real insights about the situation? No, I think uh, what we did was um, the situation was to step up as ESMA, the, uh, the data collection uh, via NCAs to understand the use of liquidity management tools and the use of liquidity risk management in general. There, what we've seen is that we, we've collected the information regarding extraordinary liquidity management tools and the commonly used ones. And what we've seen is, uh, in general, is, is, a, is very modest use of, of the exceptional liquidity management tools, which basically is 0.2% of asset under management. We're, we're temporarily suspended in the last week of, of, of March 2020, and the great majority of these suspensions were due to, to valuation uh, and uncertainty. So in that sense, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a picture that, that is, uh, again, uh, not, not that, that concerning, but in, in connection to our NCAs, we really stepped up uh, our efforts to, to, uh, to get an insight uh, on, on the market as such. Okay, um, when I remember better than expected, and uh, given the difficult situation, um, uh, Patrick, um, uh, do you agree with the evaluation of um, Abbott and Jos? Uh, yes, definitely. And uh, even for us, I would say it was better than expected. The um, operational resilience uh, was, uh, was really good and contingency plans worked. Um, I would say that uh, we had some difficulties with um, some brokers uh, when during lockdown. 
and uh, with counterparties and fund administrators uh, who had operational difficulties, both related to lockdown, not only in Europe, but also in, in Asia. And also because not only there was lockdown, but there was also a, re a incredible amount of transactions. Uh, so that caused a few issues on, on NAV calculations. Uh, but I would say that uh, it, it didn't, uh, it wasn't systemic and didn't create uh, uh, big long-term issues. Uh, so um, on the whole, uh, industry adapted uh, really very, very quickly. So I, I would, uh, and on, on the management tools, uh, the, the, I would say that the extreme management tools uh, weren't uh, used a lot, as, as it was said, uh, uh, very few um, gates used. So, so that's uh, very positive. And on the soft liquidity management tools, I would say, uh, such as swing pricing, uh, they were they were efficiently used, and uh, asset managers uh, adapted on that too. So that's very positive. Okay, thank you, Patrick. And um, turning back to Robert. Um, uh, do you think the operational playbooks worked uh, both on the level of the NCAs and uh, at the level of IOSCO? Is it reason for a humble view or maybe uh, to being proud that everybody works? We, had, we have heard just some positive um, evaluation. Do you agree? Well, you know, when you, I, I was sitting there thinking back of what it was like um, uh, in late uh, March, early April when all of this was taking place. And um, it didn't feel quite as um, smooth as everyone is saying, but looking back, it's surprising how effective some of the measures actually have been. For instance, you know, what we've, what have, were designed as um, uh, short-term um, resiliency measures in terms of working for home, we've actually seen an industry now working from home for pretty much uh, most of the, the last six, seven, months and remember a lot of those those uh, plans were actually meant for temporary um, purposes so you could say that um, those plans uh, uh, have been remarkably resilient actually that being said in the early days there were a number of firms that uh, I remember um, we were having to deal with within the FCA who hadn't properly defined what um, essential workers actually were and a few of them actually just sort of blanketly said, everyone's essential. And many of you will remember clogged tubes in London um, as people were trying to get to work on a reduced number of, of underground lines that were actually um, operating at the time, uh, which meant that there were still firms that hadn't really um, thought through uh, fully how they were going to manage um, uh, their, their businesses in that, uh, in that crisis situation. But that being said, in the long haul, it does feel like when we look back on, on those, um, uh, on the industry as a whole, it does feel uh, that that side has, has worked quite well. I think when I was referring to clumsiness earlier in my previous comments, I think I'm referring to um, some of the liquidity management tools that we, um, have highlighted at IOSCO over the, uh, over the course of my chairmanship there. And um, there still seems um, some reluctance in the industry to use what people call the more extreme tools. Um, but that being said, uh, uh, I can't say yet whether or not there were some uh, tools that shouldn't have been used or were misused either. We still have a lot of work at IOSCO to do. So I, I, I'm only commenting from what I've seen and picked up from um, my various members at this point. Um, uh, we will be conducting some more work in this space going forward uh, because we do want to have a better picture globally in terms of, of what's, um, what took place. But it did feel like uh, uh, there was still some uncertainty as to when to pull the levers on some of the more extreme tools themselves. Thank you, Robert. Your further work uh, you just mentioned, we'll have a look on it later. But I think now it's time to be interactive and have a view on the results um, of the short survey we had in the coffee break. The question to the audience was, what would you identify as primary source of vulnerability for the asset management sector at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic? Question, uh, the answer, limited 
liquidity management tools availability, 22%. Valuation uncertainty, 41%. Liquidity issues, 28%. And data gaps and unfit reporting framework, only 4%. Any other reasons, 4% only. Let's uh, discuss the view of the audience here. And um, uh, first, uh, let's compare Patrick. Uh, you, what is your um, experiences? Uh, you, you as an asset manager, uh, you're quite active in several countries. Um, when you look at the vulnerabilities, where would you cast your ballot and maybe uh, have a different view in the different legislation? Uh, yes, well, well, first, uh, I wanted to emphasize the fact that, uh, as we said, there were liquidity uh, issues um, on uh, money market instruments and on, on high yield uh, and emerging market mainly. Uh, and I would say that uh, funds mirrored the difficulties on the asset side. Uh, so in that, I think that there weren't major vulnerabilities in that uh, we can say that funds didn't amplify those uh, uh, liquidity issues on the asset side. So that's something uh, very important, I think, to uh, emphasize. Uh, and um, then indeed, uh, what we mainly did is to um, uh, adapt uh, some of our, uh, what I call soft uh, liquidity management tools. So I, I mentioned uh, swing pricing. Uh, we had quite high execution slippage. So um, we changed the, the way uh, we apply uh, swing pricing during the crisis and uh, we were faced with uh, very different um, uh, interpretations and processes in different uh, regulators uh, in, in Europe. So, so I think uh, there's still, still a big challenge on uh, regulatory uh, convergence uh, from that point of view. Uh, and then on the use of different uh, other li different uh, liquidity management tools, uh, it, all regulators made it quite clear that we couldn't change the, the net asset value frequency uh, during the crisis, so, which I think uh, is quite logical. Um, but it, that has to be uh, also thought about uh, after the crisis and uh, for, for the future. Uh, and then one other uh, tool which uh, is, is not uh, very um, liked by regulators is the use of overdraft. I think uh, that uh, we should uh, think about that again uh, as a way to, uh, to help um, uh, funds uh, when they, they can't put it with uh, liquidity uh, issues. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, we have heard several times uh, the issue of liquidity management tools. Um, uh, when we all remember the last reports by IOSCO, even 2015, 17, 18, we've always seen there is not a level playing field over Europe regarding the availability. Uh, the audience here today has voted 22% that the limited availability of these LMTs was a crucial point. Um, Everett, uh, from your point of view, um, how did you react to in the last years uh, to the uneven availability of the LMTs um, I also described, and which was your role uh, within that. May, may I add the question, uh, is this evaluation from the audience understandable to you, the results? Yeah, so maybe to start with uh, the last question, uh, yes, uh, I, I personally, when I made a, uh, a pick. So, what, what, what would be my my uh, my top two? I, I would pick the same. Um, but I think the all all four elements uh, A to uh, to D are, are relevant in this uh, in this in this uh, crisis situation. Specifically on liquidity uh, management tools, I think it's it's no secret that uh, as has always been a proponent of the um, of the availability of effective liquidity management tools across Europe in a consistent way. Uh, that's not been the case uh, during the crisis. It's not, not, it's not the case now, is that there is a consistent availability of liquidity management tools in all national jurisdictions. So 
Um, echoing also the ESRB recommendations of 17, I think it's quite important that we get there. And this is also uh, clearly still the, the point of view of, of ESMA going forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, now, um, Jos, is this uh, evaluation by the audience understandable to you? And um, uh, maybe I like to add the question, uh, you as a Dutch AFM, how did you tackle um, these vulnerabilities? Maybe you can give a, a personal view just on, on these points as well. Well, uh, I uh, do recognize the choices of the audience. Uh, from my national perspective, I would have chosen number C, uh, liquidity issues. As I mentioned uh, before, we had the issue of margin calls by the pension funds. I think in, in general, we can say that banking regulation has been tightened. We have now a central clearing system. So the pressure has moved to the markets more or less. And we wanted a more market-based uh, financing instead of bank-based financing. Okay, now we have to learn how to manage it because now that's where the pressure is showing up. And what does it mean for micro and for macro potential policies? And I guess that's, that's where, uh, where we are now when we have to, to think about how to, how to solve that. That would be okay. my, uh, my reaction. And uh, again, uh, asking li um, liquidity issues. Uh, maybe you interpret it as uh, liquidity mismatches, or let's take that into the focus. Did you observe li relevant liquidity mismatches of, um, of high interest for you as NCA role? Well, what we, what we saw is that, uh, and, but I, I come back to the same point all the time. What we saw was quite large uh, emerging goals for the pension fund. So they had to raise this cash somewhere and the, the cash was not always directly available. So in a sense, that is a, a mismatch. And you start to think about how can that be? Because over the last few years, they must have had huge incoming margin goals. So how can that be? Yeah? What, what, is, what has happened to, to liquidity management at the uh, individual, individual level? So there, there is a mismatch that we can look at from a micro potential uh, issue. And, but there will be a trade-off there between, between stability on the one hand and, and a, uh, yeah, efficiency on the other hand. And maybe we should make the trade-off, make the cutoff point at a different place in the, in the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, thank you. Um, uh, let's have a look on the uh, choice data gaps and unfit reporting framework. Um, probably to those the, uh, having made a response here, this seems only of a major issue regarding the vulnerabilities. Um, uh, so let's have a short discussion between uh, you, Evert, and again, Patrick. Um, uh, does it mean uh, the asset managers are providing enough data, relevant data to extract insights for the, for the NCAs and supranational supervisors. So um, first, Patrick, what's your view on that? Uh, well, I think that um, regulators already have quite a lot of data, um, both that data from the AFM uh, reporting and also a lot of data, line by line data on new sits, which are sent to many central banks. Um, I think that uh, in any case, uh, after crisis, uh, regulators uh, will want and should uh, look at the lessons for the, the, those crises and will want uh, ad hoc additional um, information to understand the, that crisis. So I think that what was uh, was done uh, since March uh, is quite normal. But that does not mean that the additional very detailed reporting which is asked after crisis uh, should be something which is um, asked for permanently because uh, that uh, is uh, operationally very uh, difficult. And uh, I'm not sure that uh, regulators will actually uh, have the systems and the um, resources to uh, use all that uh, data on a permanent uh, uh, time. So I, I would say that uh, Regulators already have quite a lot of data, and I'm insisting on the line-by-line -line, uh, data on, on usage funds, which is available uh, 
for most uh, central banks. Thank you, Patrick. And now to Abbott. Um, we heard from Patrick, uh, asset managers provide enough information. Have you been able to extract enough um, insights out of the data, uh, enough information? What's your view? Do you agree with him? Um, so let me first say is that, as, as was rightfully mentioned, there is a difference between a crisis situation and before. So ESMA has really stepped up through the NCAs to, to collect data on, on a more frequent uh, basis, which was not available uh, before, before the crisis situation. One thing that this crisis has learned again is the need to have granular, frequent and, and, and current data to be able to gauge what's going on. And um, what I would still like to stress is uh, a lot of NCAs do not have usage granular data. It is with central banks, but it's not necessarily available to NCAs and certainly not to ESMA. Uh, there's anyhow, there is a gap in usage data reporting, which is quite important. And, and for example, to illustrate this for a large extent, ESMA's work is based on commercial databases, nothing to do with any reporting requirements uh, whatsoever. And we see this as a big gap in, in the way we, we can, can uh, monitor uh, markets and, and regulate and supervise accordingly. And this also applies to a lot of the non-integrated uh, NCAs out there. Let me jump directly into that, um, Evert. Uh, what is your recommendation for closing the data gaps? Yeah, so we, we've, as ESMA, we've written a, a letter in the context of the AVNV review to the Commission arguing for um, specific uh, addition to the AVNV reporting on uh, li liquidity uh, data. Uh, and we also echoed is that this is, uh, although this was in the context of the AVNV review, is that for this we should have a similar reporting framework uh, being installed, uh, preferably uh, the sooner the better. Uh, Robert, from your perspective at Eliosco, do you agree with Evert or are you a little bit more uh, experienced from you of you as a supranational and see different <laughs> NCAs working in the legislation? Uh, have there been areas which have performed better regarding extracting information? Uh, I I don't think there have been areas that have uh, or ends that have necessarily been better extracting information. I think from the international perspective, um, we often think that there's not enough data out there um, to actually properly supervise what's going on. A lot of this comes down to again um, understanding what's taking place in in the liquidity space. So. Like our colleague from ESMA just said, uh, you know, uh, there is a lot of data that comes not from the firms but from the from commercial sources that helps. But you know, when we compare ourselves with our central banking colleagues, I think central bankers have a perspective that there's much more information that we know about what's going on in the management of funds than we actually do, and they're often a bit surprised that we can't um, uh, can't do as much as as they would uh, they would like us to do. That being said. Um, we have actually set up a small task force at IOSCO to look at data and decide um, what is pertinent for us at the international level to actually have to help um, help uh, uh, move forward and look at liquidity uh, in, in the future. Um, uh, you know, there is the, the I think the issue at regulators and with firms is there are so many data requests and um, and sometimes, as our colleagues have said, they're used in crisis periods where we need to quickly uh, get, a, get an understanding of what's actually taking place. But at the same time, there's a lot of data that firms um, provide even on a, on a periodic basis uh, in a non-crisis period that I'm never 100% certain is actually data that's even useful today uh, with the issues that are out there. So I personally think there's, uh, there is a, uh, uh, a need for us globally to be a bit more aligned in terms of what data we actually think is pertinent to keeping our eye on the, on the liquidity picture than what actually is collected today. It's 
it's very different depending on um, jurisdictions. Some jurisdictions do a bit of a better job than others, but um, uh, it's hit and miss around the world. Okay, in fact, thank you. Will you elaborate? No. Robert, yes. Okay. I've said will you fact, elaborate? Okay. I, uh, will you elaborate most, a little bit? More? So it's sorry. up to you. All I was going to say is most jurisdictions don't really collect that much data at all. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of our leverage project that we're um, we're uh, putting together a template for how to measure leverage, and most jurisdictions um, will have to actually change their regulations in order to collect that type of data. In Europe and America, we've been collecting data in the fund space through AFMD and also through um, through uh, uh, well, Endport in the U.S. and their their related reports. But the point here is. Uh, most jurisdictions around the world don't really collect that much data on, on funds and activities within funds. Okay, and last question to Eva Daniels. Uh, why do you turn to external data providers? And in what cases maybe? To Eva, please. Well, the, the, the reason why is, very, uh, is, is quite obvious because we can't get the data otherwise. It's, uh, it's, it, it's apparently it's, it's the most the most effective way to get the data uh, in, and and this is this is all about usage. Um, I think that that's the 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 the, the direct answer. Mm. Yeah, thank you. And Jos, yes, oh, sorry. I agree. Uh, I agree with that. We also have some data wishes, and we also use commercial uh, databases. Uh, for that, but I want to warn that more data is not always the magical solution to everything. For me, it's it's at least as important, or maybe even more important, to have good qualified people in the office who have a good network, who have good contacts in the sector that they can use in times of crisis, and that is at least as important as having more data. Thank you, thank you, um, uh, Jos. I think uh, when we remember the positive reactions and uh, the congratulations in the first round of that uh, discussion. I think um, uh, this is a, a good hint for us all. Now, um, I think now it's time to switch to the next block. How could we strengthen the resilience of the fund sector? Before we go deep, I want to ask the audience to bring in your questions and typing in into the chat function. We get it collected and in roughly 15 minutes, will uh, convert to it and extract some questions which are most important um, to you. So uh, choose the chat function to place your questions. Thank you. Now, um, how could we strengthen the resilience? Um, what should be done? Uh, who has more homework to do? Uh, the policymakers, the competent authorities, or the asset managers? First question goes to Patrick. Um, who has more homework to do of these three? Three, please cast your ballot, Patrick. Uh, well, the first thing I, I want to say is that um, again, I think that the, the industry has really shown its resilience. So, so, my first reaction is that we don't really need to strengthen the resilience. And as I said, uh, the, there were issues of, of liquidity on the asset sides, and the funds, as they should, mirrored the. the uh, some of the liquidity issues. And here it's very important uh, to make a big distinction between uh, usage funds, which of course uh, must uh, remain uh, liquid and provide liquidity to investors, and uh, other funds, um, AFE funds, for example. Uh, so first on, on usage funds, it's also related to the question of uh, what should regulators do uh, with, with data? I don't think we can look at usage funds uh, globally and all the usage funds uh, together. What's important is to look at individual um, fund level. And uh, I don't think uh, global data and aggregated data will give you much information uh, on that. So uh, I think that the, the usage um, framework is a very good one. And, and that uh, the only thing that we need is maybe more um, supervision at, at uh, individual fund uh, level by, by uh, uh, regulators to apply the rules which uh, already exist. Um, however, on, on uh, 
the other space, which is uh, main AFES, uh, I think it's, it's a very different uh, story. I think that uh, regulators uh, should uh, sometimes accept liquidity mismatch. Uh, and also that uh, we should continue to uh, educate investors that they can't have uh, liquidity, um, uh, capital protection and performance and that we investors should be uh, invested uh, on the uh, long term. And uh, when I see that uh, there was a speech by Stephen Major this morning and, and yesterday Essner published a paper saying that the first priority was uh, alignment of fund investment strategies, uh, liquidity profile and redemption policy. Uh, I'm a bit concerned that uh, this would might mean that uh, it's absolutely impossible to put uh, private assets uh, in um, open-end funds. I think that uh, pol policymakers should, should change a bit on this and that uh, even though we've had the crisis, uh, it's important that uh, we work collectively with regulators and uh, asset managers to uh, explain to investors that uh, they must uh, invest on the long term and that will allow them uh, not to focus on daily valuation. We saw in the, in the questionnaire that valuation was considered a big issue, but it's only an issue if you're a very short-term investor and you look at daily valuation. If you're on a long-term, you should accept um, uh, less uh, daily valuation and to, to, to stay on the long-term so that uh, you can have a illiquid premium of, of private assets. Um, thank you, Patrick. I saw some nodding from Jos. Do you agree with Patrick regarding homework to do? Um, he mentioned uh, educating uh, investors and so on and further measures. Do you agree with him regarding the homework to do? Well, in the end, uh, the homework always ends up with the asset managers, I think. So uh, there's no, uh, no escape from that. Uh, maybe to, to, to start, there is no such thing as an optimistic regulator. So I don't want to be too too optimistic. There's no room for complacency. We should always try to learn. And I think we should study basically the, the whole range of, uh, of, 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 of possible solutions for, for the liquidity um, issue. For me, that was the most important uh, thing that came up. Um, at the um, level of the, the funds, the market level, and maybe also the central bank level. I think it starts, and maybe that's the, the flip side of what Patrick meant with, uh, with education of uh, investors. I think there should not be any false liquidity promises. And certain yeah. types of assets are just not liquid. Uh, so yeah. that should be indeed told to the investors and, uh, and the fund managers should have the guts to tell that and not send out a nice brochure and explaining that no, you can have your money back at any time you want. So that's what, what I mean by no false liquidity promises. I think they should look at the at the uh, at the LMTs they have at their uh, at their disposal in the in the prospectus. I think on a more general market level, we should deepen the CMU. That's what we are working on in Europe, and that is one one further factor that could improve the uh, the liquidity uh, situation. Issues like convergence and, uh, and supervision. Uh, the, the consolidated tape, uh, increased uh, retail participation, issues like that. We should also wonder, are our macro prudential tools sufficient? Should we, um, now we have, we can do something on, on leverage and on, on suspension, but that's more or less it. Is that enough or not? At least we should study it. And then also the issue of central banks, should they have a, a uh, yeah, facility for funds to maybe pledge securities and get liquidity from them. Something worthwhile to study. I don't have the answer at this point in time. So yes, there are, it's quite a bit of homework for those people who, uh, who have to do the studying and afterwards it have the, has to be implemented by the, uh, by the industry, I'm afraid. And okay, and a question now to Evert. Um, we have seen the CSA from ESMA during the summer. Um, do you have already first insights out of this exercise? Um, 
that being a work in progress, uh, it, it's it's clear that I, I cannot say a lot about it apart from the fact that uh, the CSA was started clearly in January, and and will uh, due to the, uh, the the real life stress test, it has been has been delayed. At the same time, uh, I can say is that the outcome will be there in, in Q1 of of next year. So that's uh, that's going to be there. But I would like to take the opportunity to react to Patrick because um, I think we don't have. Uh, he was referring to the report that we published today on the ESRB request regarding uh, corporate debt funds and real estate funds, where, where we did a, a stress test uh, exercise. And we, what we've seen there is this misalignment in, in, in various cases of investment strategy and redemption policy. But what we're not saying is that um, there, there should be therefore an issue with the type of, of assets that you're investing in this is more, and that was Jos was referring to, is this the, the overpromising is that you still see illiquid assets combined with daily redemption promises, and that, that's that's not going to work. Uh, that's that's still, uh, in some cases, it it is uh, the case. Finally, from my side on homework, I think still. The, the availability of liquidity management tools in a consistent way across Europe. I think it's very important, whether it's national rules or EU rules that would facilitate this. Again, it was already mentioned by ESRB in their recommendations. Quite important that this, this type of homework is, is, it would, be, uh, would be done from our uh, perspective. And I think there's also a role for supervisors. If uh, what we've seen is, is if, if there is a um, a supervisor who encourages the use of liquidity management tools, it increases also the effectiveness of liquidity management tools used. So therefore, we also feel that there may be a role for supervisors going forward there. Okay, thank you, Avet. And regarding the effectiveness of this liquidity management tools, um, Robert, uh, will your current work at IOSCO level, maybe the FSEG engagement group you're working with, uh, will this bring you insights and maybe completely new recommendations are coming up? Well, what we're doing, um, we're about to launch an actual review of the, um, of the implementation of our liquidity management tools that we um, released, uh, sorry, the uh, paper that we released three years ago. And we're going to uh, look at uh, how they have actually been implemented within various jurisdictions around the globe, alongside questions about what happened uh, uh, earlier this year and the um, related financial crisis. But that being said, I just want I, I reinforce um, uh, some of the comments that um, our previous co uh, speakers have, have made. In our paper on liquidity management tools, we did stress the fact that we really advised um, asset managers to look at the liquidity of the assets that they're managing and determine whether or not same, uh, one day, uh, sorry, same day um, valuation was, uh, same day um, liquidity was, uh, one day liquidity was an appropriate thing to be offering. And, you know, at the time we had a big experience in the UK with the property um, uh, crisis. We saw some of those issues arise again uh, just recently. And um, and what I, I would just stress is, is that, it is something I suspect most asset managers have not um, uh, taken a closer look at is um, should you be should you be offering liquidity every day on your funds when you have essentially a portfolio of, of less liquid assets that in some in some instances have a hard time even finding a valuation um, uh, as well. So I would really stress that um, that. Uh, you know, it's more than just whether or not you have uh, the ability to suspend, whether or not you have the ability to um, use swing pricing, et cetera. Um, it's also what you've done in terms of uh, thought about your actual, the actual product that you're offering the market and what sort of liquidity your, um, your clients actually expect to have from what they're investing in. Okay, thank you, Robert. Let's turn to the LMT usage itself. Um, uh, question open to the round here. Um, uh, 
uh, who should decide about the LMT's usage? Is it only the asset manager or can you imagine a situation where you, especially in your role, you recommend a broader common action of implementation driven by any authority? Um, uh, I want to open this question to uh, all these panelists now who, who want to answer first. I see Jos is um, unmuting. Well, I, I was unmuted all the time, but I can say one or two things. I think it should act, it should start with the asset manager, actually. And I mean, uh, they have the, the, the role to manage their, uh, their fund and uh, so also manage the, the liquidity of the, of the fund. There can be situations, but then we are really at the extreme end where maybe we need to do something. Sometimes you need to play a kind of broker role that no one wants to be the first to, to suspend, but maybe you can get a few together. But that's only at the very end of the spectrum. I think first and foremost, it's the role of the, the fund manager. Okay, and um, Everett, um, uh, it's only at the extreme end of the spectrum that you can uh, as well uh, imagine that ESMA will play a role regarding the kicking in maybe some central LMTs usage, or is it totally out of scope for you? So the, uh, I think we, make it, we have to make a distinction between uh, the role of, of asset managers, the SBAs and ESMA, because they, they, they're quite, quite, uh, quite different. I think I would agree with, with your certainty is that it's its primary role for, for the asset manager to, uh, to decide and, and use the kinesis management tools in, in, in the way that is, is uh, appropriate uh, for a perspective investor protection. Um, I think their uh, NCAs, according to usage, uh, they, they have the possibility to do so, but that should be a uh, subsidiary to what as man manager doing. As what comes in, I think where it, there may be a requirement or a need to, to do this in a coordinated way, because a lot of uh, the fund offerings are uh, across jurisdiction. So in that sense, uh, also given the complexity of fund regulation, sometimes it's, it is necessary to have a coordinating role uh, if this is uh, a, a, a evolving multiple jurisdictions. So uh, there, there I can see a coordinating role of ESMA from a European perspective. Well, um, uh, Patrick, that sounds quite acceptable to you as an assessment, uh, does it? I fully agree with uh, what was said. Uh, so that uh, ESMA should, should intervene uh, uh, when it's really a, a systemic and, and uh, cross-border uh, big issue and, and when uh, there's a fear that asset managers won't want to, go to, to uh, act first. Uh, I would just add that there's also quite an important role uh, of national competent authorities uh, on the design of funds. Uh, when they authorize ex ante, they should discuss, I think, more with um, asset managers uh, how the liquidity management tools uh, should be activated. And for me, that's the answer also to the question of uh, uh, asset managers have, uh, authorities have enough data. It's not an issue of uh, finding uh, with uh, broad aggregated data where we think that there might be a problem, but it's more discussion, an issue of uh, NCAs uh, helping uh, and when they authorize funds, uh, looking at individual funds and individual uh, mechanisms of how uh, the uh, liquidity management tools will be used in case of crisis. Uh, thank you, Patrick. There seems to be a broad agreement on that. To stir a little bit up, um, Patrick, once again, a question to you. Can you imagine um, uh, ESMA to play a major role in the future regarding to the present one? Or what is your uh, dream team of cooperation between the different NCAs? Uh, well, I think we still have uh, quite a fragmented uh, European market and there's quite a lot of uh, national specificities. So uh, I still see for quite a long time, a big role for, for national uh, uh, NCAs, um, but as we said, uh, 
uh, ESMA has a, a big role to play um, for uh, supervisory convergence. Uh, and it was clear before, but the crisis has definitely shown that uh, liquidity management tools aren't uh, interpreted the same by different uh, national um, competent authorities. Uh, and therefore, uh, ESMA has a big role to play there. Uh, Ebert, I think this is a home run for you. I, uh, you won't disagree, I guess. No, I certainly don't disagree because, um, as Petro rightfully mentioned, uh, supervisory convergence is, is quite important. That is the role of, uh, of ESMA to try to converge on, on uh, uh, high priority elements. And uh, I think what this, this situation has shown is there's still a need for more supervising convergence uh, for ESMA to, to take forward. Okay, thank you. Um, I ask again the audience to use the chance to type in into the chat function the question. I will collect it and I'd rather like to be interactive and give the chance to you to answer the question um, to, the uh, to the panelists. So um, let's do some a little bit free out of the box thinking. Um, I heard some discussions in the last years and last days, even that each decade um, in the past had a special focus uh, of authorities focusing on certain intermediary sector. Um, will this decade of special focus of um, financial um, or, uh, supervisors will change from the banks in the last decade from now to the asset managers because they have a right, they are a rising contributor in the financial intermediation area. Um, so what's your view on that? Let's go top down and start with um, uh, Robert. Well, I don't think it's changing this decade. I think it changed in the, from basically uh, the post-financial crisis. So, you know, when you look back, um, the central banks felt like they managed to deal with the bank uh, in terms of liquidity uh, in the early part of uh, this, uh, this past decade. And um, uh, we started to see discussions in the non-bank finance sector and a whole new sort of committee grew up at, at both the FSB and then later in terms of a work um, agenda at IOSCO. So we went from the non-bank um, finance group at FSB uh, to an agenda of issues that the FSB asked IOSCO to examine in liquidity. And, um, and then uh, IOSCO has now created its own um, financial stability engagement group as well. And what I, I think right now, as far as I can see, this, this agenda is just going to continue on into um, the next um, the next decade itself when we're looking forward because I'm not hearing too much coming in um, to take uh, take over as uh, as a as a huge priority especially when you have both central bankers and um, international regulators now working to uh, understand all elements of liquidity within um, uh, in within that I think there's been a huge shift though because we used to call it shadow banking, if you remember. And um, now we're starting, we have a much better understanding of what, um, what asset managers really do in this space. And they have undoubtedly picked up a lot of uh, non-bank finance just by the simple fact that banks themselves don't uh, operate in this sector to the level that they, they did in the, in the, um, the noughties. Um, but as far as I can see right now, we're going Continuing to have um, discussions about um, asset managers, uh, non-bank finance related activity, and we'll probably be having a similar conference next year, uh, talking about um, liquidity management tools as well and whether or not they are effective in, um, in the uh, concerns that our central banking colleagues and actually ourselves as regulators uh, have. I will say, uh, I think um, this has probably been one of the best conversations I've had with other regulators and a person in the industry itself um, around this, um, because there was a huge reluctance just with uh, two, three years ago to even go into this topic with the industry. And now the industry itself is engaging in this space. So um, I think that that has actually changed uh, and it will clearly remain 
um, a big focus of uh, asset managers and um, regulators going forward. Thank you, Robert. And uh, I just got in a question from my colleague at uh, uh, Pharma Manco SE. And uh, the question was again to you, uh, Robert, and I think it's uh, good to keep it open as well to yours, um, especially with the experience with the US Fed and the ECB and the corporations on. The question is, you have the privileged position, Mr. Taylor, of a more detailed insights across jurisdictions. In the context of money market funds, what differences were there between the action taken by the US Fed and the ECB? And what impact did this have on the effectiveness of such action? Uh, Robert, please, and then uh, the comment of yours. So um, I, the way I'm going to answer this is because we have a report that's about to be published and I'd actually hoped it would have been, um, it would have been made available before this, but we're still not in a position to um, publicly talk about all the details that we've found and also what mitigations we'd be looking at. Um, I will say that, the, but, I mean, by the simple fact that uh, there's, a, there's a difference in size in those markets in the U.S. versus um, even in the European sector, there, were, there, were, there are some differences that existed. But I feel like right now, from the IOSCO perspective, I have to be very cautious about um, hinting, uh, giving too much information away. So if I can, uh, I know it's a weak answer to that question. But you will see some insights coming from Inosco, um, uh soon uh, when our, our report is made uh, public. So I expect we will read it thoroughly just to understand the differences. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. And uh, Jos, uh, you had close contact with the other uh, NCAs and I think even with the ECB. Uh, what's your, your view on that? Well, actually, I can't. I also cannot add too much uh, on that. I think uh, in the U.S. they have more experience with, let's say, market-based finance than we here in Europe, where we are still moving from banking towards more markets. So, in that sense, I think the the Fed has also more experience in being active in the, in markets in general, having a networks of people uh, available. And so, in that sense, maybe they were a little bit more effective because they have been longer in, in, in this business than the ECB. But uh, I do not have the detailed uh, information to back that up, actually. Okay, thank you, Jos. And uh, we are nearing the end of the session in three minutes. In two minutes, um, we will close. But let's have the last question to Evert. Um, uh, regard, if you could draw a map of your dreams in the future regarding harmonization, what, po what points would you draw on that map, regard, especially relevant for the asset managers? Harmonization, what are the most important points for you to, for, for the work you expect and hope for? Uh, that's, that's a very sweeping uh, uh, question, uh, uh, Joachim, I think, uh, and a very, very interesting uh, one. Uh, you know, clearly, it's, um, I think, from a perspective of, and we mentioned supervisory convergence, I think it's it's quite important that we we keep on, on going on the path of further supervisory convergence in the sense of, and that there are two elements to this, in the sense of, having indeed harmonized uh, regulation, which is uh, directly applicable from a European perspective to flesh out any differences, which is basically a cost to, to mark participants. And subsequently having uh, the most effective way that the various NCAs are supervising uh, the asset management market. I think that, that, is, that is clearly uh, what is very important. Um, and it's it's not not something that you you do overnight. So I think we're, we're making progress. And uh, but you you were you were talking about my dreams. My dreams is that we we were a step further, indeed, in in supervisory convergence based in the context that we have with national regulators uh, and national supervisors uh, still 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 very much uh, doing uh, what they they are doing at in their national jurisdiction. So I think uh, that that is, from my humble perspective, I think that is that should be the goal going forward. 
Uh, sorry, one thing that I still want to stress on, on the former point of the, the modern market funds, one thing that we should take into consideration is the big difference between the US and the EU is that in the EU, there can be no sponsor of a modern market fund sponsoring or helping out a modern market fund, which is, is the case in the US. So direct, super, direct uh, intervention from a central bank cannot be done in the EU. That has to be done through intermediaries, credit institutions who are intervening in the market. In the US, that's a different story, but that's a very deliberate choice of the difference between the EU and the US. And the EU made the decision based on an earlier crisis where you had this conflict yeah. of interest. Sorry to, to mix my dreams with a very mundane story about money market funds. So thank you very much, Evert. And I want to thank you all for your contribution and ideas. And let's go now from the dreams just to the lunch. I do hope you will find a tasty lunch prepared for you wherever you are. So stay healthy and safe. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.